Okay, I'm going to have to edit this in. I, I said this, anyway, it's annoying because YouTube has uh, dropped their video editing program, so I'm going to have to find one somewhere. So this is going to take longer to upload than normally. But anyway, so the combat is, is on, say, one-to-one. -one. Classically, you're going to be one-to-one -one because... Um, let me see. Two, I'll take off two folks. I can remember where they were to put them back. Okay. Let's have a look at these fellows. Um, so on this side you've got the combat strength, so it's two and two, and they, every, every unit is two, and they, they have flip side is one. So um, it's, what's the scale? It's 100 metres per hex, and the cavalry units are 100, the infantry is 150 to 200 per counter. So it's, I think it's all quite well historically researched and, you know, based on that. But anyway, so then apart from, so so classically you're attacking on the one-to-one. -one. Um, if you attack someone from outside their zone of control, so from flank or rear, as it were, then they class as one strength. So then it would be two-to-one. Obviously, if you gang up, you get better odds. But then the next thing you do, the blue circles, the movement rate, the next thing you do is compare this, the nine and the six. Now that's the morale. The Russians are all at six morale. Some of their allied units go up to eight morale. And the Polish are all eight morale or nine morale, um, especially for their hussars. So what you then do, say if we're attacking at the one-to-one, -one, then you do the morale differential. So um, if, if this Polish fellow is attacking, he'll get one, two, three. So he'll be on that column. And if the Russian fellow is attacking him, it would go down one, two, three. So you can see instantly the um, Russians get a lot of disadvantage in um, attack and defence um, because morale counts for both. Um, then the next thing that figures in is the army morale. Now the army morale, it would start here at zero and then every time a unit is lost, it will go up towards the Polish side or down towards the um, Russian allied side. And in my scenario, I've played one, two, three, four, five turns, and these are all the lost units. <laughs> you can see there's tons. So it's been, it's been sort of bouncing up and down, but it's, it, the poles have the advantages. So it's right up there. And it starts on 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 2, 3, 3, 3, and the last one's 4. So at the moment, that, that indicates that the Poles, that over, they have an overall 3 advantage in morale. So if we start at 1 to 1, 1, 2, 3, because he's 9 versus 6, and then because of the army morale, 1, 2, 3, more. Then the Poles have another advantage, is if they have Hussar units, and it doesn't actually say in the rules which is which, I have two choices. One is that it's only... Um, there's a Polish leader. Um, where, where's the unit? Okay. Some counters actually have a lance, you can see. So there's a lance depicted. Um, all of those counters have nine morale instantly. There's some units like this one with nine morale, which doesn't have a lance. So either I go with the nine morale units at the Hussars, or the ones with the lance depicted are actual Hussars. But either way, and it's then it's going to make a huge difference. You can um, use your lance bonus. And if you use your lance bonus, it adds the same amount of your strength again. So you can see we were here, one, two, three, maybe one to three to four because of armor roll, and then another bonus because of your lance. I don't apply it in defense. Um, you can only use it in attack. Um, so you can see it's very easy, even on a one-to-one um, -one basis in strength, for um, it to get up to, say, a 9 to 1, 8 to 1, 7 to 1 on the attack column. What does that mean in terms of the results? Well, it's, again, that's a bit odd. Like, if we take the 1 to 1 uh, column, you have a B2. The B is um, Defender, so that's Defender Retreats 2. Defender Retreats 1, and they have minus 1 step, so they would be flipped. Um, defender Retreats 1. That's what they both get minus one step. The attacker gets minus one step. The attacker one, attacker retreat one, minus one, attacker retreat one, blah, 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 minus one. And the R, as far as I, I've worked out, it means an automatic dispersion. 
because what happens is when either side retreats, they retreat that number of hexes and your opponent gets to follow that number of hexes after. And then you also check for dispersal. So the R is the Polish um, thing, dispersal. And uh, so you check what type of unit you are. Is it a Pichota, which is um, uh, muskets, and what morale you have. Um, uh, cavalry morale six, so that's all the Russians, and these are the Allied and um, uh, other cavalry, and then the Hussars. Oh, that's all. So this is morale. So yes, oh, nine morale is always a Hussar. Okay, whether they have a lance or not. But anyway, so you check that, and then you check your A1 or B1 results. So say if you retreated two, and your cavalry with morale is seven, you roll another die, and on a one, you disperse. So you, you retreat and then you're taken off the board to the dispersal pile and half of your dispersal pile comes back next turn um, on or adjacent to one of your leaders and the leader of your um, contingent or uh, with the Russians they don't seem to have any contingent so you just come on with any leader. So it's a bit odd in that you might get a retreat result of up to four or five but then you just r go here and you disperse anyway. So um, I've been counting it as, but the dispersal you roll for after retreat, it says, so I would, for example, retreat the, say they're in a fight and the pole wins, one, two, three, retreat him three, and then he f would follow up three because you have to follow up and then he gets dispersed. And that is important because what you'll find is, you know, situations like here, you'll get, you'll when you advance after combat you ignore zones of control so if he retreats then he will come in and then he's behind the enemy lines as it were which um you know creates interesting situations so for example i had a pole a couple of poles right in the depths of the allied camp you can see the remains of some there and uh, this is one trying to escape so um what all of that boils down to is that you get these you start off with lines and you might, you know, send a line forward and then you, people break through and the, people move around and you're trying to surround a unit so that when it can't, if it has to retreat, it's going to die. And the Russians really have to do that because um, you can see there's there's no automatic deaths and generally um, at the low odds, the Russians are losing themselves. Attack, retreat, attack, retreat, attack, retreat. So um, what they want is, this is the best result they often get, is the defender retreats and um, he's surrounded. You're rolling on a D 2d6, that isn't often going to happen, but anyway, surrounded can't retreat and is eliminated. Um, and that is, real, that is really the only way that the Russians were getting those kills um, from forcing retreats. And maybe from higher odds being sort of on the one to one, even two to one, which doesn't often happen because, for example, look at this. You've got he's one step and I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. OK, he's upside down, but imagine seven, eight. That's that's eight to one. So I'd start at eight to one. But then if the difference in morale is two or maybe three, already I'm down to five to one. Um. So yeah, that is good odds, but you know it takes a lot for the Russians to get that. But anyway, the upshot of it is, is you get these swirly melees with lots of units, on in odd places, and you know lots of fragmentation. Um, I don't like that that much, and I don't. I'm not sure that it might represent the situation well. I guess that's what happens after a while as your lines break up. I mean, these ones have been kept in reserve. For a long time, so they've held their formation. Um, the, the Russians are sort of they've sent in all their reserves now, and their allied forces are pretty much all in as well. So they're down to their last legs, and it has just turned into this swirl. But it's kind of like it's not really so much fun, like trying to chase down single units like this, especially when, as the Russian, you know that you're. The victory all depends on losses, so you're losing on losses. The only chance they have is if the Polish leader dies, which is only going to happen on a 12, on a 2d6 at an opportunity, 
and it also happens if the Russian leader dies or it retreats off the board, then the Russians are going to win. So they're just trying to go for that unit at the moment. Um, you can see there's opportunity because of the breaks in the lines. But the Poles, in this scenario at least, they ha have an another disadvantage that is built in that every turn that the morale is in the Russian favour. They lose that many units. So the, the sort of the Polish favour, so, sorry. So because the Poles sort of start off on the right foot, they already have a morale bonus, so they, they, which gives them a bonus on the table, so that they inflict more losses, which gives them, as that creeps up, another bonus, so then they inflict more losses. And then every time that's like, if, they, if it's on one or two or three or four, then every turn, the Russians have to lose one, two, three or four units which is what's been happening so it's kind of like a downward spiral for the russians and i don't know it must i think I, at the start i thought oh they're gonna stand no chance but then i thought oh they seem to be doing a lot better than i thought they would so i started thinking maybe they have a chance and i think if i'd sent in um the allies earlier they could have done better but um each side was sort of holding some forces back so as not to get into this mad chaos and uh, it's degenerated into that now and in in that situation it's you're just sort of dealing with individual unit combats and um, there doesn't seem to be any real um, tactic going on you know you're just sort of hunting and destroying each other in, in odd isolated combats and it's not so much fun to game now I'm looking forward to trying the um, original scenario, the historical scenario, the Poles are going to set up here and then they can launch their attack. And I'll be interested in that up to the point where it looks like they're going to be winning or not. You know, can the Russians and allies withstand it? But after that, it's just, I'm sure it's going to degenerate into this again. So um, you've got artillery charts. The artillery don't have much use because you're only 2d6 and they're normally 2 strength. So at range, of, you need range of one or two. You're only going to inflict one loss or dispersion or dispersion and loss. Um, so that you know you don't you don't often get that. And when when a unit is at that close range, they're pretty much on you the next turn. You're going to get one more sort of defensive fire hit, and then they're going to be um, uh, retreating you. And as artillery, you don't retreat. You you just die so the artillery aren't a big factor um so essentially and the infantry um just function exactly like cavalry it's the same combat table they just have slower movement rate and of course no chance of lance charges so um other factors to talk about uh, you have these wagon trains there seems to be no purpose for them on the russian side on the polish side if they are taken out they lose 50 lances which brings me to another point they the Poles start the game with 190 lances, so you use one of these chits to mark. They got 150, and then there's about 40 individual ones which you put on the board as to remind you which ones are doing a lance charge. Um, so there's four of those, so you could, and each one's worth 50 lances. So potentially you could take out all all of the Polish lances. I presume in the battle they keep going back to get fresh lances because they break their old ones in the charges, but. Without, that's going to take pretty dastardly play from the Russians, pretty cunning play to be able to get round the lines and get there. So I don't think that's going to happen that often. So that's a kind of like a, a factor which, it, you know, you've got all these chips to market and it's not really going to be a big factor. So um, again, I, I think it, it would have been nice to see more of a factor of why the wagons are on board or something happening with them perhaps like a morale hit if they are taken that's going to be bad by the russians though actually i was considering setting them up in the marsh hexes because it's prohibited terrain there's nothing to say you can't and then they would have been protected but of course i don't think that would be in the spirit of the intention of the rules so um it's it's lovely looking game and the pieces are lovely um it's a very simple, easy system to play. Um, having said that, I do have a few questions. You know, there's grey areas which needed to be addressed. And I don't know, it, it seems to be a thing in, in many other languages apart from English 
um, in that they use a lot of words to say what you can say in very few words, at least in English translations. So you find space wasted in the translations, which could have been used to clarify rules instead of sort of saying what we want to say with repetition and reiteration. So that's a bit of a frustration, uh, nothing that I think can be resolved with a designer being Polish. And it's not that the rules translate fair enough. Um, I think it's a good translation, but it's just there's some gaps in the rules. I had to make a few house rules, for example, in um, advance after combat being particularly the most important one. What are the actual permutations of it? Um, so uh, there you have it. That's my coverage of who's in 1610. Now this is, um, I bought it, um, the sales pitch from the designer. She told me it's an astounding battle um, whereby the Poles managed to stop the French invasion of Poland for you know like another hundred years. Um, I hope I got that history right, as he told me. So it's uh, I, I thought I'd try it. It's it's his it's a few years old this, and it's a new system, the Hasaria system. So he's got some old some titles set um further back in history, which I was tempted by, you know, like 13, 10, 10, 12, something like that. And uh, that uses a different system. So this is specifically for, for later warfare with the, those Polish lancers, the Hussaria. Um, so it's nice to have a game on this subject. And like I say, it would be nice to see that magnificent charge, which must be where they got um, at least... 50% uh, of their reputation from, he says, speculating wildly. So that's all I think I will do for the coverage of this for now. Um, I've been happy to introduce on my channel um, this game company and this game. And uh, next up, I'm going to try um, this, Varsava 1944, by the same company. This is an older design, and obviously World War Two. I bought in... Um, Poland 10 years ago and I was trying to, there's a Polish forum on the tactics and strategy website, an English forum, sorry, on the, the Polish site and I, I've been trying to get rules through there which um, well, I wasn't successful but now had them direct from the designer um, um, via email and again I posted that to Board Game Geek and some others just to help people to sort of get into this company and see what the games are like, and uh, whether, whether you know, if we like that style, I don't know. Um, so, one last look at this, and just a quick sneak preview of another game which I got at the weekend called Monte Cucoli on the Wrap. So this map is half the size of the other one, but it, and it's a system based on the Breitenfeld from Tactics and Strategy Ancient System. Um, so similar, uh, it's 1664 and um, Battle by a River. Um, we'll see how it compares to this system.